Good evening, everybody. My name is Jean Duby. I'm the president of the Sarasota Audubon Society. Again, or as I say, still president of the Sarasota Audubon Society. Um, thank you very much for joining us today on this very, very uh, crucial topic that uh, Karen and Tim will be talking about. A few housekeeping things here. Um, Due to COVID, we have still, as a board, decided not to open the Nature Center or not to have any activities. So, you know, time is going on. This is probably, was it the 10th month that we've been without any of these activities and um, the Nature Center, but that's just the way it is. <clears throat> so hopefully things will get better once we get vaccinated and once we're able to um, get outside more. Um, I want to bring you up to date on um, the Giving Challenge that we, um, the Giving Tuesday, not the Giving Challenge, the Giving tu Tuesday, we, we, we participated in the nationwide or is it worldwide Giving Tuesday uh, fundraising campaign. And we dedicated any donations that we got to that to the quad. We were emphasizing the quad parcels for that. And that started on December the 1st. And we were, um, we kept it open until the end of the year. And I have to say that our wonderful members donated $56,000 to that project, which was more than we expected for that particular drive. Uh, it's really wonderful. Uh, this brings the total raised by Audubon, you, all of you members and friends of Audubon uh, for the quad to uh, $150,000. And although we will need much more to restore the 30 plus acres, we are really grateful for all of these donations so far. So it's, it's really wonderful. In the spring, which isn't too far away, we'll be able to share some concept plans with you to get to give a better idea of what we're going to do. Um, but that's still, we're still good, a good month or two out on finalizing some of those plans. All the donations that received for the quarter, of course, dedicated to that project. We cannot use them for any other reason. And this year, as you all know, Audubon has not been able to generate any other funds, basically from sales, from bird walks, or from workshops that we do. And we rely upon those things to get us through. Uh, currently, we're squeaking by this year. Uh, we're re relying more than ever on membership membership dues and any donations for general purposes. So please continue to help us thrive. Let's hope that next year is gonna be a full year. Um, we have, Stu Wilson is our Christmas bird count coordinator and he sent in a truncated report. He was unable to join us tonight, but um, this here is, um, is the, the apparent species count. He's always hoping for some more birds. And uh, that this Christmas bird count occurred on January the 2nd. And there were, if you look at the bottom, we had um, 158 species, about 35, well, 35,400 individual birds and 135 people participated, which includes people calling in their sightings from their feeders, from their backyards, from their neighborhoods, where if they hadn't joined a specific team. And the highlights you can see are ruddy duck, nighthawk species, which um, Margie found, um, king rail, Virginia rail, and sad to say, we found, <clears throat> one of our teams found gray-headed swamp pens at the celery fields. Many of you may know that this is an invasive species, a very aggressive species. Uh, we have been expecting these birds to show up and lo and behold, here they are. Um, what's worrying about them is that they are actually voracious destroyers of wetland habitat and also aggressive towards purple gallinules. So we are thinking about what we can do about them. But anyway, moving on. Um, so these highlights, 190 red knots, that's great because some years we don't even get one on a Christmas bird count. A short bill dowager, 55 eagles. Wow, that's a high count for recent times. 
barn owl, red-headed woodpecker, northern flicker, merlin, six peregrine falcons. Wow, that's really awesome. Um, Yellow-throated vireo, that's really unusual. And one of our counters found two, which is really fabulous. And one thing that's really interesting for us, the purple martins, you can see that nine were found. Um, it wasn't too long ago when we would never find one on a Christmas bird count. We expected purple martins to come in from South America around the middle to the third week of January, but now they, they're actually coming in two or three weeks earlier. In fact, they came and the martin houses weren't up. And so there was a big scramble by Sue Garashi and Terry Shukma to put the martin houses up because these birds were very angry that they weren't there. Um, white crown sparrows, we found three this year. Somebody had chipping sparrows. Eastern meadowlarks, five, that's really great. Bronze cowbird, ovenbird, red start, and dick sissel. The ones that are highlighted um, require special documentation. So, and Stu always focuses on the dips. Dips, dips mean birds that we could have gotten, we expected to get, or we knew were around, but on that particular day, nobody spotted them. And if you look at Greater Scorp and you see the CW, that means count week. And what that means is that in the, in the, bit, the, bit, in the Christmas bird count day was the second, and for count week, National Audubon allows us to record any bird three days prior to that count day and three days after. So that's what a count week bird means. So, um, so the count week birds are ones that were seen within that three day period back on you know, either side of January the 2nd. And then these other birds, Northern Bobwhite, Western Sandpiper, Common Tern, Crescent Caracara, Hermit Thrush, Toey and, and Black-throated Green Warbler. And those are birds that um, we have been seeing in the past years. I personally know that Bob Whites and Eastern Toeys, if you look back at Christmas bird counts 10 or 15 years ago, we would have recorded about 13 to 15 Toeys and maybe a dozen Bob Whites. But now we, we are seeing them being extirpated from our particular count circle, which is really sad. And that's of course due to development and especially of um, pine flatwoods. So uh, Stu is going to give a more detailed write-up of uh, the Christmas bird count, and that will be in the next Brown Pelican. So that'll be at the end of the month. So thanks Stu for coordinating that. Um, it's a fun day for everybody. Um, the, the slideshow that Karen was showing before uh, noted a few things, one of which was, um, can you put up the, the red stock birding one? Yeah, yeah, I will do that. I'm getting it now, so. Okay, so red stock birding red is a, an organization in Ohio that sells optical equipment. And they contacted us last week and asked us whether we could host them um, a sort of a road show and uh, they want to and we said yes we would like that because many of you know that we cannot find optical equipment readily in southwest Florida you can't just walk into a store and see a range of optical equipment so the red start birding um, representative is going to come and bring different kinds of telescope different brands and uh, scopes as well and this is going to be by appointment only. It's very controlled due to COVID. So uh, sometime tomorrow, you'll be able to get on our website and, and we will announce this in our various um, publications and also on, on SRQ Bird Alerts, how to make an appointment with Wendy Clark. And there will only be two people allowed at a time to look at the equipment and it would all be sanitized and you have to wear masks and so forth. And also there'll be free bird walks um, hosted by Jeff Bouton to, for you to go into the field and test the equipment. It's a great opportunity if you're looking for optical equipment 
So I would encourage you to look on our website tomorrow. Um, we may send an e-blast out before the end of the week because this is going to happen on the 22nd, which is just next week, I believe. So that's one thing. And the next slide is for um, Chris Wood's um, presentation, if you can find that. Unfortunately, I just found out that this is a conflict for Margie, who is giving a presentation on swallowtail kites down at Venice Audubon on that very same evening. So um, maybe, Margie, maybe we can talk about it and maybe change our time or something. I'm not really sure. However, this is going to be a great presentation because Chris Wood is in town. He's helped us on our Christmas bird count. And he is one of the co-developers of eBird, which many of you use constantly. And what he's going to do, he's, his, his presentation is going to tell you what eBird does with that data and how they analyze the data, how they gather it, analyze it, interpret and so forth. So I think it'll be a very, very interesting, um, interesting event. And you'll be able tomorrow to be able to click on and register for that, just as you registered for this today you'll be able to register for that event. So I've said it all now. So back to Margie, you wanna take over and- um, Let me give the background. I forgot to do that. Talk about webinars. Also, uh, there was already a question in the chat about backgrounds. So these three backgrounds that you see on this slide are available to our members. Um, you can see I'm using one now um, with the Lou Newman Snowy Plover. We have the Catherine Young uh, red-headed woodpecker and Chuck Behrman's um, spoonbill at the celery fields. So if you want any of the, either any or all of those, um, send me an email and um, I'll send you those. Um, so well, welcome tonight um, to our webinar. Um, and I'm gonna stop sharing. And we will then, um, the, we will have Q and you can put questions in the chat, but if your questions are for the speakers at the end, um, please use the Q and A, which is also at the bottom of your screen. Um, it says Q and A, and if you open that up, you can ask questions of um, the panelists. Um, also, there's a poll, we'll be sending up a poll um, during my talk. Um, and you'll be able to answer a poll and we'll see, we'll see what you, what, how it all works. So um, that'll be just a multiple choice. So trying to make it a little interactive tonight. All right, go ahead, Margie. Thank you. Um, so I just, um, we're speaking tonight on the, I would say I'm putting my own title on it, but the and tremendous urgency uh, for us all, every single one of us listening and everyone who isn't listening to deal with the climate crisis. Um, I, I'm sorry, what was the exact title? You, you can give, I have everything else here, but not the title, but. The climate that sounds change, good. Local yeah. science, local solutions. So. And we're uh, gonna talk about not making it a crisis, so. Um. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> Um, and but I do want to emphasize the tremendous urgency uh, with which we should all address this issue. Um, before I even introduce um, Karen and Tim formally, uh, I don't know if anybody heard the Dalai Lama talk to, to Greta Thunberg, who is the very um, young high school student from Sweden who mobilized uh, a uh, just a tremendous force of a million kids or more, um, and I mean kids in the best sense of the word, uh, to deal with this issue. And they were all talking about how this has become uh, just extremely urgent. And I didn't even realize just how urgent it is. So with that as a preamble, and this is not my talk, so uh, I'd like to introduce the speakers. Um, Tim is gonna go for 30 minutes talking about the latest science and local impacts and then Karen will follow up afterwards. So to introduce Tim Rummage, he's a planetary ethicist and professor of environmental studies at Ringling College of Art and Design, where he teaches courses on environmental science, sustainability, 
creating ecological cities, applied environmental design, food, water, biodiversity, and environmental ethics. His recent work focuses on biophilic design, which is the incorporation of nature's services into urban design and infrastructure. Uh, he also focuses on the economic value of nature as well as climate change and sea level rise. His early research areas included marine mammals, bats, pelagic birds, and environmental surveys. He's a frequent lecturer at other colleges and community organizations and leads workshops on sustainability in the US, the UK, and the EU. Along with David Houle, am I pronouncing that right? Houle? Correct. Houle. Tim co-authored the book, This Spaceship Earth, and co-founded the nonprofit organization, The Spaceship Earth, Inc. He serves as the chief science officer of this organization. In July, 2021, he will become the chair of the District 6960 Environment Committee for Rotary. And our very own Karen Willey, the Nature Center Manager for Sarasota Audubon, and Climate Point Person for Sarasota Audubon is an NIA Certified Interpretive Guide, which means that she is a Certified interpret Interpretive Guide for the park rangers. Uh, she's also a Certified Climate Change Interpreter through the National Network of Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation, a network of science scientists and educators committed to changing the public discourse around climate change to be positive, civic-minded, and solution-focused. Karen has spent the last 40 years walking local trails and learning the stories of our land. She has a Bachelor's of Science from the University of Florida in, in ornamental horticulture with an environmental studies minor. She sold, it's, I guess it's your company, the Ben Nature, Tours Environmental Education Company in July 2019, after founding it 20 years earlier. She's a climate change communicator, flower hunter, people connector, tree hugger, and an educational consultant, yeah. helping folks to learn more about Florida native plants and ecosystems. Her motto is go wild and learn the Florida story. And with that, take it away, Tim, please. Okay. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, share. Okay, so uh, what I want to talk about tonight is issues of climate. Uh, I'm going to do it in a couple of different ways. Um, this first part, um, uh, I'm going to do it as an approach from um, the fact that all the conversations we've had the last several years about climate you know, there's always been the split of, you know, we can't do anything about it. We need to do stuff about it. Um, and we sort of seem to be living in a Dickens novel with there's sort of a tale of two paradigms. And um, the first paradigm and our current economic model being a linear one, basically looks at um, resources as a commodity, something to, to be commodified. You manufacture it, you can, can make a product um, and then you generate waste. Uh, it's a fairly limited, uh, straightforward uh, linear system. Um, economic growth is the prize at any cost, uh, and it is very much shareholder centric. Um, um, so the model that we're currently operating our economy under you know, favors business having a short term outlook uh, with very limited responsibilities for consequences and basically seeing all problems in isolation. So, you know, as the standard cartoon goes, you know, what environmentalists have to understand is the destruction of the planet may be the price we have to pay for a wealthy economy. Sort of a parallel conversation we had uh, throughout this past year of, do you want a healthy economy or you know, a healthy um, uh, public uh, in the conversation about COVID and jobs? Um, the current, current model for economics basically also views pollution, natural resources, environmental harm, and social harm as externalities, uh, which are not included in determining profits or return on investment. Um, so whatever pollution we 
those companies generate whatever we generate um, basically is considered to be free to the economic system uh, and of no consequence. Growing up, we had, uh, there was the adage that, you know, there was no problem that business could not solve. Um, the issue with that, or the problem with that is that uh, business has to see something as a problem. And if you can externalize pollution and harm, then the things we're concerned about never get dealt with in business because they're not seen as a harm. Um, as Upton Sinclair said, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends upon his not understanding it. Okay. So releasing greenhouse gases into the air is just an externality of doing business. Uh, but we happen to know that it's more than that. Okay. This is the uh, underlying cause of uh, global warming, uh, which is the triggering factor for everything else. So in the normal uh, manner of things, it, sunlight comes in through the atmosphere. Um, some of it is absorbed. Some of it is uh, reflected back into the atmosphere. Um, we need to have some of this greenhouse gas in the atmosphere just to help stabilize the temperature on the planet at a level that uh, is good for um, the current makeup of the species of the planet, you know, us and the birds and, and the mammals that we're all familiar with. But we have been adding too much uh, greenhouse gases. Um, and so what we've really done is created more of a thermal barrier to the heat escaping. And as a result of that, we're dramatically warming uh, the environment um, and greatly exceeding the amount of uh, carbon dioxide that should be in the atmosphere relative to the, um, our history, uh, our crops, um, our urban design. Um, and so, um, uh, so a quote that I came across from, from Pope Francis talks about the fact that God always forgives. We humans sometimes forgive and sometimes not. The earth never forgets. The earth does not forgive. If we despoil the earth, its response will be very ugly. Okay. Um, and so that's what we've been doing. We've been despoiling the systems. Um, and as a resu result, we've been creating the climate crisis, global warming, sea level rise, extreme weather events, deoxygenation of the ocean, biodiversity loss, dead zones, so ocean acidification, marine heat waves, wildfires, floods, droughts, habitat loss, coral reef degradation, pandemics, food insecurity, displacement, just to name some of the big hit items that we've been doing. Um, and because of our current economic model, we see all of these events is in, is being independent of each other. Um, but the Dalai Lama and Greta Thunberg were talking about um, this past weekend, this past Saturday night, was that these are actually all interconnected events. Uh, they each trigger and amplify the other. And so, as I said, it basically starts with global warming. Once we start to add more heat to the environment, we start to change how things operate. Um, if we add more heat, we can absorb whole and more moisture in the air that starts to change weather patterns. As you have uh, a warming air temperatures, that changes the microclimates that certain species can live in. Parallel, if we warm the ocean, which we've done um, for the first uh, uh, 200 meters of the, of the ocean, um, it changes what fish can be where. Um, and so all of these things are interconnected and, but because we've traditionally been trained not to see or think that way, we keep thinking of these as separate events. So cumulatively, you know, humanity has changed more than 50% of the Earth's land service. Um, and for the most part, we didn't do that to cause harm. Um, we did it for, um, to, for primarily for economic benefit, you know, um, but never considered the ramifications of the environmental consequences. 70% of all the assessed plant species are considered threatened or endangered. Um, the average population of non-human vertebrate species has declined by 68% just since 1970. Um, and that's a real heartbreak uh, for me. I mean, I cannot, I cannot show my daughter the density of wildlife that I knew as a kid growing up. It just isn't there anymore. Um, and it is still rapidly declining. Um, the result is, what, is that we've created what we refer to as the Anthropocene. 
this is um, an era in which human activity basically drives what happens uh, to the climate. Uh, and as a result, what happens to all the living species on the planet, including ourselves. And despite our current complaints and concerns, for the most part, from a policy point of view, a legal point of view, and a business point of view, we continue to support and amplify the creation of the Anthropocene. And so we really are sort of becoming a self-harming species when we leave out the environmental consequences of our actions. I spent most of the time, we don't even recognize natural resources. We use them all the time, but we basically see products as opposed to resources. So, you know, go to a bookstore, you know, I see books, I don't see a forest, you know, clothing that's you know, basically made out of oil, you know, cars that are just all forms of geology and petrochemicals. Um, you know, so we don't really think about what we have consumed. Okay? and whether or not that material is going to be available to us again. The Antonio Guterres, the uh, UN Secretary General uh, recently gave a, a speech, um, the State of the Planet address. And so these are some comments that he made just in the opening remarks. Currently air and water pollution kill 9 million people a year, more than all cancers combined. Over 80% of the ocean had experienced a marine heat wave just in 2020. Um, in 2020, we lost 10 million hectares or 25 million acres of forest. Uh, carbon dioxide is currently 148% of the pre-industrial level and rising. Um, methane is at 260 parts of uh, percent of the pre-industrial levels and rising. Uh, nitrous oxide is 123% of pre-industrial levels and rising. Global warming is 1.2 degrees centigrade and headed towards 3.5 degrees centigrade of pre-industrial levels. The kicker about the 1.2 degrees centigrade increase in temperature is that at one degree, Celsius, one degree Celsius increase, the atmosphere can hold 7% more water. And so the first, one of the first things that happens with global warming is we also disrupt the water cycle of the planet. What's it con concerning about methane's rise and uh, nitrous oxide's rise is that both of these gases have significantly more global heating potential um, than carbon dioxide. Um, CH4, depending on whether or not you're looking at it as an independent gas or you're doing a comparison over hundred years, you know, um, has at least 25 times the um, uh, global warming potential of uh, carbon dioxide over a hundred year cycle. Just on its own, it's about 85 uh, times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide. Nitrous oxide is 290 times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide. Um, the reports just came out the last couple of days. The 2020 was the hottest uh, year in recorded human history. Even though we theoretically had a uh, drop in carbon emissions. Okay. So global average temperature for 2020 was 2.2 degrees Fahrenheit above the, ba the baseline, the same as it was in 2016. So 2016 and 2020 have been the two hottest years ever. But they got hot in significantly different ways. 2016 was an El Nino year, a weather phenomenon that tends to raise global temperatures. Um, 2020 was a La Nina year, which tends to lower global temperatures. So in a year when the globe was trying to lower temperatures and when we were reducing the amount of carbon dioxide emission from electrical generation transmission, we still managed to hit the highest temperature we've ever had. Okay. Um, the burning of fossil fuels in 2020 released 34.1 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide, um, uh, which is down 2.3 billion metric tons on last year. Um, a couple of things just to be aware of here. Um, uh, the news reports will try to get you to focus on the 2.3 billion tons less. The thing that should concern you is that we still put in 34.4 billion metric tons. Okay? Um, and there's going to be some question, because the final reports aren't in yet, 
as to whether or not we actually did have a drop in carbon dioxide. In 2019, the original initial release of uh, carbon dioxide was 36.8 gigatons. Okay. Um, I didn't include the elephants here, but for those of you who haven't seen it, basically um, to get 36.8 gigatons of greenhouse of CO2 into the atmosphere, you've got to launch somewhere around um, 220 African elephants into the air every second of every day to get that kind of volume. Um, but the normal calculation historically as for looking at carbon dioxide has been only about uh, electric electricity generation, um, transportation, and, and cement. Um, last year, when they actually included the amount of carbon dioxide released in the atmosphere because of the huge fires, the total was 43.1 gigatons. Um, and this year, we know we had large fires in California and on the west coast of the United States. Those were actually small compared to the ones in Alaska, which were three times the size. And the ones in Alaska were actually small compared to the ones that took place in Siberia. And so once that number has been calculated as to how much CO2 we put up from fires, it may be that um, 2020 uh, has set a new record in um, CO2 emissions. Some of the ways we have an impact on the planet is uh, through biomass. So biomass is the population of whatever category you're measuring, say people, times the average body weight of that category of people. And what that does is it gives us some idea of what's the energy needed to run that volume of uh, biological activity. The other thing it does is it allows us to compare the relative importance uh, in given habitats of different species. Who are the drivers, you know, who are the foundation species, who are the keystone species, things along that line. Humanity, all of us, our current makeup of the planet, we are about 0.01% of the biomass of the planet, humanity is. Okay? But we make some big changes. So if we go back uh, and look through time, you know, before humans, all mammals were wild. Okay? Today, 96% of the biomass of mammals is humans and the animals we raise for food. Okay? Only 4% of uh, the biomass of mammals is of wild animals anymore. And the same is similar to birds. You know, pre-humans, it was 100% wild. Now, 70% of the biomass of all bird life is but basically poultry. The birds we eat, the leg, egg layers, the stuff we choose for pate, you know, only 30% of the biomass of birds is wild stock anymore. But the biggest tipping point that we now know about, and this was a report that came out in early December, Humans, if you look at all the structures we have built, just think to yourself for a moment, all the houses you've seen, all the cities you've seen, all the roads you've been on, all the you know, paved trails that you've you know, walked. Um, uh, and <clears throat> at the moment, in, the estimate is that in 2040, we will double that volume again. Right now, the amount of living biomass is approximately equal to the amount of all the biomass of the human infrastructure and buildings that we have made. Okay. We double the amount of human made mass every 20 years. So 1900, it was 3%. Now in 2020, it's 50% of all the, the mass on the planet is the stuff we have made. And by 2040, if we double that again, well, you know, um, that's not gonna leave much room for other organisms to exist. And there's only one place that we can live in the known universe, and that's that little blue dot 
Um, and it doesn't change its size regardless of what we do um, with our own uh, lifestyles uh, and own models of development. Yeah. As I said, we've created the uh, Anthropocene. Nature is the opposite. Um, nature is a systems-based cooperative enterprise that fosters a process of continuous improvement in the use and regeneration of resources. Okay? That's what we should be doing, but that is not what we are doing by using the current economic model we have. Rachel Carson once said, in an age when man has forgotten his origins and is blind even to his most essential needs for survival, water, along with other resources, uh, has become indifferent, the victim of his, has become the victim of his own indifference. The human race is challenged more than ever before to demonstrate our mastery, not over nature, but of ourselves. Okay? The functional issue is, are we going to save ourselves from ourselves? Now, the first paradigm that we talked about in economics is that linear one. Um, there's a new one out that people are discussing and trying to switch the system over to, which basically is designed uh, for life and life cycles. Okay. Um, you know, I, for one, enjoy having butterflies in the backyard. Um, I do get annoyed with some of my neighbors for going out when we have butterflies, put out all kinds of you know, temporary butterfly plants around to lure the butterflies from my backyard because I'm the only one who, in the neighborhood who has a yard for the life cycle of butterflies. I got places for them to lay their eggs. I've got places for the caterpillars you know, to, to forage and stuff. Um, uh, most people just want, want the butterflies, okay? So what we're really talking about here is a change in mindset in which we really understand that the bounty of the planet is, is not just some warehouse or stockpile of resources that we can commoditize. The real issue is the biocapacity, the biophysical capacity of the planet is about how it regenerates resources. And that's what we have to figure out how to do to turn our linear process into a more circular process. So we keep regenerating resources as opposed to making waste. And in this transition, we're going to be using biophilic design. We've talked about bringing uh, nature into uh, in urban environments as a way to clean air, cool cities, uh, to, to serve other infrastructure functions. We're going to be doing rewilding, you know, um, restore uh, areas to their uh, uncultivated states. Um, regenerative agriculture, um, in which we basically are partnering with nature to protect and create extremely healthy soil that is full of the fungi, the microbes that you need to actually have very active self-supporting soil structure. There are a lot of people talk about, if you want to deal with carbon dioxide, plant trees. What I want to say is if you want to deal with um, CO2 in the atmosphere, what you really want to do is get the soil healthy. Soil can absorb about a thousand times the carbon dioxide the trees can. You know, so this is what we need to do, and so we can do this in our own yards. You know, um, is generating soil, getting away from dirt, and actually getting into active soil. Okay. We're going to use biomimicry so that we are more effective and more efficient in our designs and have less wasted energy. We're going to need to support biodiversity. What nature has shown us is that you know complex ecosystems um, are much more stable, safer, and extremely more resilient to change than are the simple ecosystems we tend to try to construct. Okay. And so part of this is the shift to, from a linear economy, basically trying to get to a circular economy um, where you've got raw materials coming in but the whole idea is to get to the point where we don't use any more raw materials, that we can keep using the same materials over and over again to make the next generation of products that we need. And by making them more efficient uh, and uh, more effective, we don't need to make up, uh, we don't need to, to drill uh, or dig or mine for more natural resources. Okay? I mean, we need, a model of economic thought um, that links the environment, quality of life, and the uh, 
with long-term thinking. Um, and I'm saying all this in terms of economics because from an environmental point of view, most people understand this. The question is, you know, how do we translate these realities to the people who don't? And a lot of that deals with how do we deal with it in terms of economics um, that supports the environment. So, um, I mean, the, the value of Sarasota Bay resources uh, is, you know, $11.8 billion, you know, how, what's the upside of putting that at risk? Okay. The other thing is if we start doing this integrated approach, we can resolve the interlinked and interdependent system, system sorry, symptoms that we have created uh, as part of the first paradigm. Because every time we do something to reduce global warming, reduce carbon emissions, re reduce greenhouse emissions, we reduce the impact of sea level rise. We reduce the impact of weather uh, events. We decrease the ocean acidification. Um, we, de we decrease you know, coral reef de degradation. Work on any one of these and you're impacting all of them because they are all interconnected systems. Okay? The current popular term for this kind of economy um, as opposed to a linear economy is that it's a circular bioeconomy of wellness because part of what we should be doing with our economy um, is improving the health of people and the environment. Okay? There's no reason for so many people to die from polluted air and water. We shouldn't have a system of economy and policies that promotes having um, polluted air and water. We need to do the reverse. We need to clean up the air and water. Um, and so this is a, a model. And so if you want to look up more of it online, the circular bioeconomy of wellness is the phrase that you're looking for. Um, there's also an article that came out just a couple of days ago talking about the fact that climate could stabilize in several decades. Um, in an unusual example of optimistic climate change research, scientists now suspect that rising global temperatures and impact of climate change could stabilize in a matter of decades but that depends on the world rapidly transitioning away from fossil fuels to the point that greenhouse gas emissions reach a net zero. Okay. First statement, that's true. Second statement, net zero doesn't reverse anything. Net zero says, okay, wherever you are at that point, that's where you're going to hold. And as you look into the article and you look into the research, essentially what people are proposing here is that we get to net zero emissions and then use the biology of the planet, the interconnected networks and systems of the planet to absorb carbon dioxide and pull the excess carbon dioxide uh, out of the air and, have, and make sure that we have nature's ability to sequester greenhouse gases. But that really means we have to protect that infrastructure of how the ecosystem works in order to have that option. Okay. At the end of his talk on the state of the um, uh, planet, Antonio Guterres said, making peace with nature is the defining task of the 21st century. It must be the top, top priority for everyone everywhere. Because ultimately, our job isn't to foresee the future, but to enable it and that's a very different approach to what we've been doing. So, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Here I am. <laughs> I'm gonna share my screen now and um, talk to you about how to talk about it. So thanks, Tim. That was a really great background on where we are now with our economics and the science of what's happening. And I'm going to, in this part of the, the talk, I'm going to be urging you all to become climate change messengers on behalf of Florida's irreplaceable birds and habitats. So the goal is to enlist all of you as well as decision makers 
in altering climate change planning around the state so that the conversation on sea level rise and climate change isn't just about the built environment and people, but it's also about planning for the natural environment, wildlife, and especially birds, because this is, after all, Sarasota Audubon. So I'm gonna ask you all a question. Wake up, because I want you to type um, in, the, um, in the chat box, if you could look at this beautiful picture that says climate change is often communicated in ways that lead to inaction. And tell me what's wrong with this picture. So anything, anybody wanna write in the chat? I don't have, do I have, yeah. Nope. Polar bears and penguins. Yes, thank you, you got it. Polar bears are at the North Pole and in Arctic, in Arctic, the Arctic Circle and the penguins are at the South Pole in the Antarctic. Um, also, another, um, another thing about this picture, it is, it's beautiful and peaceful and um, cute cuddly creatures. And you start thinking about what do polar bears and penguins have to do with me? I can't help them. So it's not going to induce you to make any kind of action. Um, and then there are the headlines, right? Where's my, there's the headlines. And the headlines, um, deforestation and climate change threaten the most beloved wild birds. Antarctica could melt irreversibly due to climate change, study warns. From sea level rise to habitat loss, the effects of the climate crisis are on the verge of making South Florida uninhabitable. My goodness. Click the wrong place. How does this make you feel, right? All these things overwhelm us and our ability to adapt and generate, they generate feelings of helplessness. In order to counteract these effects, we need to stop talking crisis all the time. And we need to communicate that change is possible. And that's what I hope to help you do by the end of this presentation. So we wanna better publicize productive efforts by people and organizations that are reducing their carbon footprint, because that's the key, um, right? As Tim said, when we burn fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas, we add carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is causing this heat trapping blanket if you will, around the earth. And um, we're heating the air and the water. So we need to do everything we can to change that. So we wanna have productive public conversations and civic engagement. So um, I'm gonna ask you to, I'm gonna put a poll up. We're gonna launch this poll. And you, can you see the poll? Can you all? Yes, good, you're answering. I wanna know how many, um, what percent of adults in America think climate change is happening now? So go ahead and put what you think. I'm seeing a lot of 25s and 72s, 48s. Okay. Good, I'm getting, I've got 70% of you have voted. Cool, when it's, I'm gonna let a few more. Don't wanna end it, um, we'll see how we do. Okay, here we go, share results. And can you see the results? Cause I don't know what you're seeing, yes? Okay, so 48, people said 48%, 20% of you were right. Oops, where's my clicker? It's 72. So this was done um, about a year ago now um, that the Yale Project on Climate Change Communication 
And they found that 72% of adults in America believe are sure that climate change is happening. That's a lot of people, right? But only 38% are talking about it. And of that 38%, some of them are only occasionally talking about it. So I think it's really important for us to understand that we are in a majority and let's start talking about it. So I'm gonna help you now to, to talk about it. And um, first thing is avoid the crisis tone. And what you wanna do is, is, is get people to care about it. And in order to do that, you wanna find common ground. And the common ground, um, when, you, when you come up with something that you can agree on, and talk about, because when you think about it, everything, everything out there is related to climate change. So if your common ground is, is the birds, then talk about what, how, how the birds are being affected. Um, Jean was talking about the purple martins, right? They came two weeks early and the houses weren't up yet. And we scrambled and got them up for them. So that is a direct effect, or it could be a very direct effect of climate change because it's warmer it's not going to freeze and here they come so um there's your you want to come up with common ground and also values and what are values they're the ideals that um we things that we believe as a culture are ideals to live up to so these aren't necessarily um they're not only religious values but um something like pragmatism is a value Pragmatism is um, if we have a problem and know the solution, then we should fix it. That's pragmatism and that's a, a value. So we also need to understand that everyone doesn't care about the environment and climate change the same as we do. Um, but we, so we did some research and we, I mean, NOKI, my, the National Network for Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation about 10 years ago, they did a survey of 5,000 people and they did a pretty much a cross section of America. So um, different socioeconomics um, and ages and um, what they found were two, the two values that spoke to most Americans, the strongest were protection, the value of protection and the value of responsible management. So I'm gonna talk about those two. Um, remember that values are the underlying core beliefs that motivate us to behave in a particular way. Okay, so let's talk about protection. Protection matters because we have a duty to safeguard the well-being of people and places. So I can share these, um, if you wanna email me afterwards, I'd be happy to share these with you and um, um, you can use these words directly in your communications. So we must pre preserve and protect the habitats and ecosystems we depend on. Showing concern for others is the right thing to do. These are all things that have been tested and, and come up to be um, really speak to people. So let's be vigilant in shielding people and places from harm. Stepping in to ensure people's safety and well being and taking measures to eliminate. Um, okay, and then the other one is responsible management. Protection actually measured a little higher, but they were both super high. So whatever you feel most comfortable in using is good. Um, and responsible management matters because taking common sense steps today is in the future of, in, in the interests of future generations. So that's a real key. We want to be responsible when it comes to the environment. Um, let's look ahead to handle the problems before they get worse. That's responsible management. Responsible managers keep an open mind. They look to evidence and take level-headed, step-by-step approach. And remember that key, future generations depend on the decisions we make today. So all of these are good talking points when you are speaking to someone about climate change and that common ground that you found. Um, so
So those we want protection, responsible management are our values. And now how are we going to make this better? We're going to work as a community. And so community is um, not just our neighbors and the people in our town. We speaking tonight, um, I'm speaking to a community of fellow bird watchers, right? So I'm going to ask you to interact again, if you would, in the um, in the chat box, just type one one or two words of what a com what community can you think of, um, other than Audubon. What's another type of what's another community? Book club, homeowners. That's good. Church, absolutely. How about? Um, Seniors, yep. Yep, your, your school itself is a community. Your um, field of work, right. My other um, botany friends, garden clubs, there we go. All right, so you're getting the idea. Communities come in many forms. And um, so we want to talk to, um, we want to talk about community level solutions because our, the scale of the problem is global, right? We're talking about global climate change. And so yes, um, individual solutions are good and we're not saying they don't matter or make a difference, but what we are saying is that collective solutions that engage communities are gonna match the scale of the problem. Um, when we're talking about, um, Biodiversity on a large systemic scale, we can't be just one person recycling. Does that make sense? We have to be um, collective solutions that engage entire communities to match the scale of the problem. Besides, it's more fun when we do it together, right? So Here's the some solutions. They we want the solutions to be um, evidence based, um, and we want them to address the problem. So, when we understand the problem can be addressed through practical steps, this fosters hope. And then, if we're hopeful, we're going to engage in action, right? Um, so we can empower people who are already concerned, that 72% that we have found out we're in a majority of, um, we can empower them by giving them solutions that are collective and local and already in place. And we're gonna highlight actions that are local and in place because they're not necessarily gonna be highlighted in the media, um, but they are something that we can do, we can do now. So some specific programs that I use, well, actually, I'm going to go to there next. So we're going to, we want to be specific and explicit and find common ground. And think about those values. So there are social norm, um, something that if, if it's something that more, more and more of us are doing and it becomes a normal thing, then it's going to help to change. All right. So some specific community level solutions that I offer when I'm giving talks. Um, Ready for 100 is, uh, it's, a, it's a Sierra Club thing, but there are two local groups, one in Sarasota, the Sarasota Climate Justice Coalition, and in Manatee, the Manatee Clean Energy Alliance. And they're both working with our communities to make them ready for 100. Now, Sarasota, city of Sarasota has already committed to this and they're working towards it. And they're part of 163 cities nationwide and 30, 13 counties that are declaring that they're going to be 100% non 100% -re uh, renewable energy by the year. Many of them are saying 2035. So um, the you can join these two local groups. Um, you can also join the Sarasota Bay Guardians. This is a group put out by the Sarasota Bay Estuary Program. You can contact Darcy at that email and ask to be put on the list. They have an event coming up on February 15th. 
um, at South Lido. They're doing a coastal cleanup. Um, and of course, you need to register because especially now with COVID, um, they want to make sure the numbers are not too great. But it's a wonderful way. You can see some um, folks doing a planting here out at Perico Preserve about eight years ago. We planted those plants that are doing amazing right now. So it's a wonderful local group that helps you get involved to counteract climate change by putting things in the ground and cleaning it up. And then the last thing I say, because I always like to have three, um, uh, three uh, examples, is vote. Vote for the candidates that are going to do the right thing, because true community change can happen quickly when the people in charge understand what is needed. So these are some examples of community level solutions that are real, they're local, and they, they're happening right now. So doesn't that make you hopeful? This could happen. All right, so one solution that I'm not able to participate in this year, but um, we're currently on hold due to COVID, but I, I should have been starting last week, the Friday climate walks. And this would have been my, our third year, and I'm hopeful maybe before the end of the spring that we can pick them up. But I've got the schedule here. So we missed Emerson Point and we're gonna miss the next couple. What I do is at a different park, um, every Friday we meet and talk about how climate change is affecting that park or preserve. And then we talk about solutions. Um, so, I started this in 2019 and we had um, 10 walks and 64 participants. Last year with the help of Sarasota Audubon, um, they, um, they promoted it and then we got a great write up in the Herald Tribune and we had 10 walks before COVID hit and we had 170 participants. So I'm hopeful maybe we can get 10 walks in this year, but we can't have 170 participants because of COVID. If we do start, it'll be limited numbers and wearing masks. So hopefully we can get this going. But this is a, a community solution. We're talking about it. We're out there and working together. So um, this is Florida Audubon. They have, if you Google Florida Climate Messenger or, or go to floridaclimatemessenger.com, it takes you to an Audubon Florida page where they um, give you ideas and things you can do to be a climate change messenger. And um, they encourage you to learn about different habitats and the birds that depend on them. So habitat loss is one of the main drivers of species extinction. So our coastlines in this picture, this is a great picture by Lou Newman. Um, oh no, this is Tom Carey. This is not a Lou Newman. I've got a Lou, Lou Newman later, so. Um, and on the coast and our, our coastal critters are especially these, um, the summer um, nesting colonies of skimmers are really at risk to sea level rise due to climate change, but our upland habitats are also climate strongholds and they're very important for um, birds and wildlife. This is a photo of a red cockaded woodpecker that depends on old growth forests. So when we cut down a forest and it regrows, it's not good for the, um, for this red cockaded, they won't use it until it's old again. So um, that's something to be really concerned about. The dry prairie, really important as well. This is Mayaka or um, Duet Preserve is also dry prairie. Here we have the Florida grasshopper sparrow, which is um, in very steep decline. And then our favorite scrubby flatwoods um, at Oscar Shear State Park. The Florida scrub jay is endemic to Florida, found nowhere else on earth but the central Florida scrub. And unfortunately, that habitat is a really good, easy to build on. There's no drainage issues. Um, it grows citrus really well. So we're losing that habitat and our scrub jays. It used to be you were guaranteed a sighting of a scrub jay when you went to Oscar Shearer. Now, um, not so much. At one point, they were down to 15 birds. I know they're increasing again, but um, 
it's due to fragmentation and there's nowhere for them to, um, to go. They're, they're stuck and they're genetically um, hampered. And then we can't talk about habitats without talking about the celery fields. And the king rail, Cornell has um, documented that they've lost 90% of their population in the last 50 years. And that's really dramatic. So we need spaces like the celery fields, even though the celery fields is not, uh, has, it's been restored. It's not, in it, it's not the original sawgrass marsh that it was, but it's no longer a farm field and it is a very um, successful functioning habitat as you heard in the um, Christmas bird count report. So um, Audubon, Florida encourages you all to be climate change messengers. So I'm gonna just go over our, um, what, we, what I've gone over today and let's review. So you wanna, when you're talking to your friends um, and family about climate change, find common ground, something that you, you can agree on. Use a reasonable tone, don't, don't scare them and, and um, make them run away. Um, use the values of protection and responsible management. And your solutions are going to be community wide, local, and existing. And practice. The more we talk, the more it's going to happen. And we need engaged citizens, communities, and leaders talking about climate change. So there we go. Um, you can email me or Tim, if you have questions. But right now, feel free to um, put your questions in the um, Q&A, if you would. And I think we have one already. You want to lead us, Margie, in the Q&A? Sure. Um, Mary King asks, I think at the beginning, the perspective, I think this was when Tim was talking, mm -hmm. the perspective is very US focused. We need a much more global systemic perspective. The initial presentation seems very localized. Glad to see reference to Pope Francis encyclical. Um, so you are talking global or are you talking North America? Tim? You're on mute, Tim. I'm, I'm talking global, but the thing is that the whole system is scalable. The issue is that we have a global economy. Um, and so we have to do this, you know, ultimately when it comes to reversing the problems we have created, it has to be at a planetary scale. That's the only way it's gonna work. Now, which of these you start at a planetary scale and, and scoot down, which of these you start locally and, and build up, that's a function of what the resources are and the particular problem in a, in a particular place. You know, the, the EU um, is way ahead of us in um, determining uh, and shifting to a um, uh, uh, circular economy, uh, to reducing pollution, not generating waste, um, you know, removing plastics, doing a whole series of things you know, that um, in some states we're not even allowed to consider because they've been preempted. Um, so it's, to me, it's, it's global, but, um, but you can start wherever you want. So it's starting, that's important. Yeah. Right, exactly. Um, Jean, Jean Duby pointed out to us panelists, and, and it's very important to realize that just supporting the quad is a perfect example of protection of the environment and responsible management. And by quad, I just want to remind everybody that that's the parcel that we were able to, um, I think it's really lease from the county that we got the county's blessings. Um, and that that's just north of if you can sort of think of it as across from the new fire station um, on Palmer Road, and we haven't developed it yet, we're collecting money so we can do that. And, you know, Tim, when you were talking, I was excited about the possibility of, of, of uh, working just even with the soil there. Of course, we want to plant trees and, 
in um, oxygen producing uh, different plantings, but the importance of, of that soil, I was just walking that land yesterday looking for birds like Dick Sissel and wow, it's, it's really kind of, it could use a lot of refreshing. So please send <laughs> us money. Sarasota Audubon really needs your money to support the, the quads and developing them to be the perfect example of, of um, supporting climate healing. Couple more in the Q and A. Yeah, someone else, uh, Michelle Reed. Um, I don't recall if this was mentioned, but I think composting is a good and simple part of the solution. Yeah, I mean, it is. But, yeah, again, it's that's about taking nutrients that you that were in your food and now restoring them back into the soil to, you know, increase soil health. So yeah, it's a perfectly good thing to do. You know, and as someone that uh, plans uh, the speakers for Sarasota Audubon, I've made a note to ask you both uh, later, uh, who would be good speakers to give us um, ideas about how to refresh the soil in our own backyards. But uh, I just wanna give everyone listening a heads up on uh, what we can do. Uh, I, I know we can do more planting uh, to take care of the butterflies, the insects at all stages of their, um, their, their growth, but also the refresh the soil. So that's just by way of what we can hear about in the future. Tracy Troxler would be a good, 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 comment, be a good place to start. Tracy what? Troxler. Troxler, okay, great, thank you. So there's a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, William Mize asks, Tim, what planet are you on? <laughs> Is it the result of climate change on that planet? <laughs> okay. um, behind me is the uh, Earthrise uh, photo. So it's the moon at the base and the Earth in the background. This is the first first photograph we had of you know, Earth on its own in space. Um, uh, but I've also joked that um, you know, uh, on on the moon we've got no problem with COVID. Uh, social distancing is very easy to do. So it's, you know, it's a very nice place to hang out at <laughs> hang out at the moment, and it's got a great view. So yeah, yeah. And. Uh, Jenny Cherry asks, um, can the websites where you read and look for daily information be shared with us? I'd like uh, keeping up weekly with information. Um, I get at the Yale Climate Communications. I'll type that in there. Um, that is a really great, they will send you a weekly synopsis of, of what's going on. I, I could put some together. I, I have 35 or 40, you know, uh, things that pop up daily just because of the research that I do. Um, you know, Yale is certainly one of them. There's a, one out in Berkeley. There's um, uh, the, there are two that look at environmental economics, actually three that do environmental ec economics. Um, there are a couple of international ones that belong to. Um, uh, um, this Spaceship Earth, uh, that website um, uh, is fairly well monitored. Bob Leonard does that and will frequently be posting commentary or examples of uh, recent important articles dealing with climate. So if you go to uh, the Spaceship Earth uh, dot org, uh, you can find that. Great. That's your baby, Tim, right? Yeah. Yeah, you know, Tim, if you want to um, send me a list, I'm going to be on Friday, we'll be putting out our weekly what's up. And okay. I can add that. Um, okay. I can add a link to that uh, document. Okay. With that. So we'll, we'll follow up with that. Okay. And Jean is saying here that um, maybe we can put a list on the Sarasota Audubon website as well. Yeah, we can do Great. that. 